Hey, welcome one and all. Oh, we talk about Bruno here on This Week in Mormons, everyone. I have got, I've got Encanto all over my life, Jared. It's everywhere. It's absolutely. Have you seen it? I have. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't. Hey, by the way, way Jared's here. Hi, this is Jared Gillins. It's the usual, right? Well, at least I didn't introduce a guest. <laughs> and then right now we're joined by Stephanie Beatri- Beatrice. Um, yeah, I dude, wish. Oh, man. Can we get her on the show? I know it has nothing to do with Twim's normal whatever, but like, let's just get her on the show. I just appreciate an artist who plays Rosa on Brooklyn Nine Nine, and like then you deep realize voice tough, yeah. And you realize her versatility as a performer in that her actual speaking voice is higher. She can sing. It's a whole other other side. It's great. yeah. When we we started watching Encanto, and I tell Kelsey that's Stephanie Be- Beatrice Rosa Diaz from uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine. She's like, no, it's not. That doesn't sound like her at all. <laughs> like, yeah. and she listened for a minute, and then she's like, oh, it totally is. And it, it was funny. I know. It's funny. Great movie. I enjoyed it. The more yeah. I thought about it, it's an interesting. It's it's like it feels lower key than some of the recent Disney things. Like there's no massive quest and huge set pieces for the most part. It's all kind of contained in the Encanto. But really, it's a movie. It's kind of about like how emotional trauma can pass down through generations. That's almost. I was gonna say like I'm not sure how you're how you're defining lower key here because like yeah, like, I, I'm, it's like multi generational family trauma. There's like you know addressing the. I mean, who knows which time, you know, which government upset where they started just murdering their own citizens in Colombia. Right. Like, <laughs> like, yeah. So I don't mean that's lower key, but you know what yeah. I mean? Like, this is not like you watch Raya and it's like massive set pieces and big journeys and frozen. Like, it's all big quests. This was a little more contained, a little more like a play. Honestly, the whole thing could have, you could see it staged as a play. Although the, the house, La Casita, Yes, presided pr- provided its own like major set pieces. Like it was cool that you know yeah, there was right. like this TARDIS style. You go inside the room and it's bigger on the inside, and you could take you all sorts of oh, interesting Doctor places. Doctor Who references on Twim, everybody. Oh, oh you said that, there was a little disdain in your voice. No, I, I don't have any beef with Doctor Who. I've never <laughs> been in Doctor Who, really. Um, but I do know Blink is an all timer episode. I will oh yeah, it. it's a good one. Any, any day of the week. Yeah, and Kanto's great. But anyway, uh, and you know you've all been watching it, people. You know you've all been doing it now that it's on Disney Plus, and I'm convinced eighty percent of North American church membership subscribes to Disney Plus. If not, well, especially more. I assume all of, any of you with kids. Like I, I know just from watching, looking at Twitter, that people who have children have not only seen Encanto once, but about twenty times, and that they listen to the soundtrack on the repeat. soundtrack's been on repeat in our house now. I do. I want to, I want, I don't, you know, feel like I necessarily need to rewatch it right now, but I do feel like it, the, the soundtrack uh, deserves further listening, especially since there were a couple of tracks that were like just in Spanish. I, I, I thought that was a pretty baller move for Disney to be like, Hey, we're going to go ahead and just, you know, if you want to turn your subtitles on right now, English speakers, go ahead. But these songs or at least, yeah. you know, major portions of these songs are Spanish only. And I was like, Awesome. Good for you. And probably like the Oscar favorite, Dos Oruguitas, Two Little Caterpillars. You know, that's, <laughs> yeah. it was all in Spanish. That was a new yeah. word for me. I was like, Oruga? what's he singing yeah. about? And, I, and, and uh, you know, and we did have the the subtitles on um, because we're getting old and that's who we are now. <laughs> and uh, and I was like, what is that word? And I looked and it's like, oh, it's Caterpillars. That was a new, new vocab word for me. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. Good movie, everybody. If you haven't seen yeah. it, good. Good show. I, I stand by it. I thought it was pretty solid. Well, next, got ex- next time on This Week of Mormons, has Lynn Manuel Lynn Manuel uh, Miranda peaked? Has he peaked? Is this the I don't end? know. Everyone thinks that. Then he just keeps. I thought we were like uber saturation point back around sixteen seventeen, like right post Hamilton when he was mm-hmm. in everything else. But he's still doing. He his managed thing. to make In the Heights relevant again by releasing a, a, a motion picture version. I of enjoyed it. Like, In the Heights, but like I never care if I watch it again. Like it was, I actually haven't seen it yet. I need to. It was it was it. it was it was very good and well done. But I also haven't seen West Side Story. I'm. I yeah, haven't I either. I need, I need to watch that as well. I've got to pick and choose. I saw I'm behind. Spider-Man. I'm behind. I did yeah. finally watch Eternals. Eh. <laughs> I liked Eternals. I think more than the critics or a lot of Americans. I, I liked it, but it, man, it was long. It was long. It did feel like it could have been trimmed a bit. But you've got to give it credit for like a lot of the biblical allegory woven throughout. Sure. And in, 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 in even like a not an on the nose kind of way, which I kind of enjoyed. I mean, like like that one character's breaking point with it's almost like a parallel to the war in heaven, even though it's kind of out of order. But when they're sitting there watching the Spanish, you know, just engage in genocide on the Aztecs, that's the point when the mind control guys like I've had enough. I will I, I will not. I will force them to do good now. This is my plan, which is exactly like Lucifer. I thought a lot of those things were kind of interesting in it, you know, like this mm-hmm. debate between agency and not 
still it could have been shorter and um and i'm not convinced that that the celestial emerging from earth wouldn't have like already caused a lot of problems like the problems only started once his hand started coming up from the ocean i'm like dude he came from the earth's core yeah like, i mean come on well, no i thought about that well are, are we doing sp- okay whatever, i don't spoilers. know this is apparently a pop culture podcast but this like, week. no no no, no. i'm just like it's you know i don't you know if you haven't no listened one to eternals spo- if you no haven't watched eternals spo- no one cares about spoiling eternals i don't think anyone cares. Uh, i just thought it was you know she's turning i was like what is she turning him into and then it was when they said you know they said you know he turned him into stone i was like so is a significant portion of the earth's core and magma stone now like how does that affect I don't know. The other, thing, <laughs> the other thing I didn't dig is that they showed the visual how it would destroy the earth because he'd basically be that large. This like he's cracking field. out of an egg, basically. But yeah. then like when he's coming up, it's one set piece. It's still He's still very large, but like his face, his hand, it's all kind of in this contained battle area, i.e. much smaller than one would... Like, I, I'm sorry, I don't even think he was as large as like the Caribbean Sea. If we're thinking about the scale we're talking about here, no. be a little consistent there. MCU. Yeah, so two, two notes for you there, uh, Disney right, well, Marvel. One, uh, she should have turned him into magma. And two, mm-hmm. uh, he should have been much, 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 much bigger. Yes. I. Anyways, I feel like if if Marvel had not interfered more in the movie, maybe it would have been better. Anyway, neither here nor there. Good times. We're here we to got talk fun, about news. About, yeah, we got a fun week this yeah. week, everybody. And of course, you can find the notes for this at thisweekinmormons.com. We always link to every story we're going to discuss. And uh, you know, and we also share these on Facebook, which you can find, and Instagram, all these great places where we do business. So please uh, take your time and go and read up on this stuff if you haven't done it already. Uh, just some highlights so you know we're going to get into. A lot going on in the LGBTQ world as it pertains to Latter-day Saints, uh, both from El- David Archuleta and Elder Gong and and some policies at BYU. Not so much Elder uh, Gong as his son, Matthew. As his, did I say Elder Gong? I'm sorry, Elder Gong's son. Um, Captain Moroni from the... Uh, January 6th incursion, we'll lovingly call it, uh, is in the news Can again. stop calling make, him that? He was not Captain Moroni. Trying to make a plea deal. <laughs> New mission presidents assigned, uh, anti-racism courses, and COVID's kind of getting real again. And I know we try not to do too much COVID because it gets, we're as exhausted about all of it as, uh, as everybody else. But it seems that uh, we're having to start making exceptions for a lot of things once more. So very exciting week. Excited to get into it. And of course, today is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and we're recording here in the evening, Jared, which is great. And uh, President Nelson led off this day by sharing a message on social media honoring Martin Luther King Jr., and he asked us all to, quote, labor together to abandon attitudes and actions of prejudice, which is terrific. It's very short. He basically shared a tweet, shared things on social media. He said, you know, today we commemorate this. He mentions the Book of Mormon teaches that black and white, bond and free, male and female, all are alike unto God unto God, rather, uh, let us abandon prejudice. And then he cited his growing relationship with Reverend Amos C. Brown, who represented the uh, NAACP. So great note, I think, for President Nelson and a wonderful reminder. And I frankly don't remember previous church leaders going out of their way to uh, counsel us so directly on MLK Day in the past. I don't know if you do. Especially since it was within our lifetimes when we had a president of the church who was openly opposed to the celebration of MLK Junior Day. So like it, we've come a long way in the last are you referencing years. Ezra Taft Benson I am and we've talked about that very very in depth <laughs> on this show with Matthew Harris yeah um, so yeah. this makes me feel good though I like seeing this this, this no I do too I think it's great and um, wh- why don't we go ahead and just do this because uh this isn't a big story but we might as well talk about it right now there's a great little um piece in the church was it church news or is the church newsroom it was church news they noted that it's been four years since President Nelson became president of the church. And there was there's just like a nice little photo journal, I guess you would call it, of like just significant moments from the last four years of, uh, of since President Nelson became the president of this church and the head prophet, seer, and revelator of this dispensation at currently. Anyway, uh, there's some really great pictures throughout there. And a couple of them, like more than one, are pictures of him interacting with and, 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 you know, hosting things together with leaders from the NAACP, which I think is great. I love that that has become a hallmark of President Nelson's tenure as president of the church, that he is somebody who is striving to 
forge bonds with the African American community, with Black communities worldwide. That uh, you know, he, he's gone out of his way to release a statement, um, and that the church news picked up on it because of the Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Like, yeah, we've come a long way as a church, uh, and I love the the example that President Nelson is setting, uh, not just today but throughout his presidency. So, I like the photo. Yeah. I like one of the photos beneath that one. There's a photo of him with uh, Amos Brown. And under, underneath that, I forgot that uh, President Nelson was down in uh, Auckland, New Zealand, because he went to visit with the imams that were uh, recovering from the uh, Al Noor and Linwood mosques that were people where people were gunned down uh, back mm-hmm. in March 2019 in Christchurch, right, sorry, Auckland. But in Christchurch, New Zealand is where this happened, this massacre. And we go out of our way to meet with these people of other faith communities and offer our help and support. I, I really love Islamic outreach that we do as a church. And I think a lot of it kind of flies under the radar. Um, I've mentioned it before on the show. I mean, like we buy a table at the care fundraiser in the greater Los Angeles area. I don't know if we're still doing it, but like church public affairs have done that for years. And like, we care about these things. And I think it's great. President Nelson's been really interesting to watch in, uh, in that sense for how much outreach he has done with all kinds of marginalized communities, which I've appreciated. Yeah. Just like you. Yep. That's good. No, it is now, good. Uh, since it's been four years, which is amazing, because I think four years ago, many of us wondered how long this guy would live, you know, given his age, right? And he's still- yeah, what is, he, is he 97 now? Is that right? Yeah, or? he'll be 98 in September. Holy yeah. cow, yeah. Um, and he's still just kicking around, right? If I had to ask you, and I'm putting you on the spot, and I want to ask this of our listeners, though, too, what is your favorite change or thing? Because a lot has happened under President Nelson. What's your favorite, perhaps, change or thing that has happened under President Nelson? And perhaps is there something that's kind of your least favorite? That maybe something that still doesn't sit great with you, or something that you don't love as much? Um, that's a good. That's a, that's a hard question because like my immediate thought was like two hour church because honestly there is something to a shorter church block that I think is really good. I do think there have been some downsides to the, the two hour block as well, though. Yeah. So it's hard. It's hard for me to say that's my favorite, but I mean, honestly, especially now that I'm a ward clerk and I have bishopric meeting and ward council and two hours and you know sometimes tithing or whatever else right, right. is going on that Sunday. Like I know I'm going to have at least four hours of church, and it and it would have been five. <laughs> so I really appreciate the reduction of our block down to two hours. Uh, as far as least favorite, that's a hard one too. Uh, but I think just off the top of my head, I would just say the restructuring. And it's not even a restructuring because here's the thing. Uh, the re-whatevering of, of the Aaronic Priesthood uh, adult leadership. I understand like doctrinal, uh. the doctrinal um, rationale for dissolving so-called young men's presidencies because there's like – the presidency of the young men is the bishop, and you know, and then and also in each quorum there is a presidency that's not mm-hmm. priest quorum. Well, I mean, no, there is a presidency. That, you know, the presidency of the priest quorum is the bishopric, uh, and so I get that they, you know, so like this whole idea that well, we can't have presidents, so instead now we're going to have what advisors and specialists, and to me that what the, I guess that what, one of the reasons I would say that's one of my least favorite things is that. Honestly, nothing has actually changed in most wards. You still have a functional young men's presidency, but it's just confusing to know how to talk about them and be like, well, the lead young men's advisor, you know, he's the guy who attends yeah. ward council. It's like, well, isn't he just the young men's president? Like, no, 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 no. That's not the word we use anymore. It's like, I just, I wish we, I, we sacrificed clarity of language for uh, correctness of language. And to me, I guess maybe that's my perspective as an editor. I don't care for it. I wish we could mm. just call it what it is. And I think functionally it makes, that's, that's kind of the ones why I haven't, it hasn't affected me a lot directly, but I kind of liked it when we had a young men's presidency and the young women's presidency as clear callings. Cause now you have the bishopric and the young women. For sure. And I don't feel like they seem to they like act in parallel. I get the reasons why they would do it. I mean, the church clearly has a a huge push for the youth. They've tried to offload a lot of the bishop's previous duties to elders quorum presidents, and relief society presidents, mm-hmm. so the bishop can focus on the youth. And now, likewise, the bishop Brick is focusing on the youth and and uh, making that take up a large portion of their time. And so, by effectively making the bishop's counselors the uh, you know de facto 
the, the you know they are the young men's presidency essentially you know bishop overseas priests first council of overseas teachers second council of overseas deacons mm-hmm. i get it i'm with you might be one of my i can't think of every other change we've done over the past few years um a big fan i'm a huge fan i don't know if this is my favorite but of getting rid of the waiting period for temple ceilings if you get married civilly oh yeah that's I definitely think- up there yeah. That has been that. That's a very, very good one. I think it's huge. There were a lot of unnecessary hurt feelings over the years, and um, like I even know some people. We actually have a, a mutual acquaintance. Yep, that is getting ma- married. Um, but they're the going to do Temple, a civil ceremony first, and then do, and then it's, I think the announcement said shortly thereafter to be sealed in the. Yeah, Temple. and that's yeah. strictly because the DC Temple won't be dedicated until July, but you don't right. want to wait to get married. And so in previous years, they'd be like, well, you better wait to get married until July, but now you don't have to, which is great. So or, you know, honestly, they, though- And I, who would I, want to get married in Philadelphia? So Not me. Um, I do think my least favorite change, honestly, is combining the elders quorum and the high priests uh, group. Oh, I like that. One body. I mean, it's fine. It's fine. But I think it affects me more personally because I feel like it's like it seems like we are the elders quorum, like going to the high priest group as opposed to anything else. So that, oh. that's just my own personal. I haven't felt that way. And also, I think you would feel differently if you were a high priest and you were like a young high priest and you were stuck I in a room with the old men. I completely agree. Yes. And I know yeah. there's like we've talked about this. There's, I've been in a lot of words where a guy might be an elder, but he's of age more to be with the high priest. And the bishop just says, you should go to the high priest or there might be a high right. priest. Who's young and the bishop would say, just go to Elders Quorum. Like that's your peer group. Yeah. Just, no, we've you know, I think we have talked about this before because yeah, I mean, I remember kind of discussing, I think, in this in this very forum, but like the idea that like, I don't know, that I don't see any need for segregation. And like what in at least when I was in Alexandria still and we attended church before this age of COVID, um, in a normal way, you know, attending church. I I loved that. You know, so I I'd sit with my friends that were closer to my age, but I'd also sit with my friends who were you know, in, older than me and that yeah. I, I loved, I liked the camaraderie that there was no need to like, you know, I'm thinking like specifically of people like, this is like, this is you and me, Jeff, but like people like Keith Mines, who it's like, why, why is it that I would, that he and I shouldn't sit together in quorum just because there's an age difference? Like Keith, yeah. you know, it's somebody who I think has great insights who, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's like, I don't know, there, 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 like no need to draw up imaginary borders, uh, to, to pretend like we can't associate it and be peers in the same quorum together. You know what? This was knee jerk on my part, and I'm going to redact it. I'm okay with it. But what I'm, I will say, I'm glad, I, I'm I'm glad I browbeat you into that. Now position. that I've had more time to think about it, honestly, it's the fact that we're four years or so in, or whatever, three years into this point. I don't know. Three to come follow me and two hour church and all that. And I still feel like, for all the correlation we do as a church, it really seems to me that the idea to plan two hour church. And to plan the way the class structure works, I, it just feels like those were not planned together. And I'm amazed nothing has come around to address it in the time yeah. since. It still seems weird to me that we have come follow me lessons every week, but you only have gospel doctrine every other week yep. or Sunday school every other week. Yeah, and that, that is, that is and, weird. And like, it's fine, but like we're missing, and it's fine because it's your personal study for come follow me. It's church supported. So every other week you get to have a lesson, but it always has seemed to me like we have the structure of how we do lessons. And then someone decided, well, we're going to do church only for two hours. And we just kind of said, all right, we'll just kind of alternate and make it work. And it's just, I guess that's what makes sense, but it seems to, it's always seemed to me like it was just kind of like it was hobbled together with from competing factions and in all the years time since we've never thought if there's a different way to do I it. I love the idea I, of these competing factions within the church office building. Which which are real people. Don't yeah. think they're not. It's it's the church office building. It is office stuff. It is people. It is bureaucracy. It is all the office things politics. You know and yeah. All those things. Anyway. Um I've got another quick one. So this was over the the uh Mormon land podcast space over at the Salt Lake Tribune, but they wanted to mention basically what would happen if all of the apostles were gone. This is less news and more like a four-year situational awareness kind of bit, I think. Um, they, they talked about this because Times and Seasons ran an article said, what happens if all the apostles pass away? Now, the likelihood of that happening is very low, we can assume, especially in this day and age. I mean, yes, there were back in the days of Joseph Smith, you had people being either leaving the church or getting, I mean, hurt or killed or being excommunicated right and left, kind of like uh, Joseph Smith would like excommunicate counselors and apostles. And things like this happened a bit more briskly back in the day. Today, we're uh, slightly more codified with how things go. So this is unlikely. But 
what does happen if, say, something terrible happened that somehow wiped out the first presidency and the quorum of the twelve? The uh, the the power, the the authority to run the church would follow the quorum of the seventy. It's as simple as that. That's how it's organized. And I think Jared, you had a, you made a good point earlier. Yeah, that's in the Doctrine and Covenants. Like that's not we're not just coming up with this on the fly. Uh, and, and and whoever <laughs> this wrote this twin article, doctrine people and whoever wrote this article isn't just like, well, here's how I propose to do it. No, it's <laughs> uh, this is Doctrine and Covenants. The the Lord establishes the first quorum of the seventy. Well, there's no multiple quorums at this point. So he just the quorum of the seventy, which we would now recognize as the first quorum. Yeah, he states without any kind of equivocation that they form a quorum equal in authority to the quorum of the 12 apostles. So if there's no quorum of the 12 apostles and you still have a quorum of 70, even if there's not 70 of them, they have the same, those same keys in authority that the 12 have. Didn't you mention there was some kind of discrepancy between something president Hinckley had said? Yeah. So hang on, let me, let me open the article. This, 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 is, this, is pedi- this is pedantry, but that's your favorite. So we... yes, I'm good at it. Um, <laughs> and if you're good at it, you should do it. Right. So there's a quote from, President Hinckley uh, from a 2005 article, and it says, the 70 who serve under the direction of the 12 apostles would become equal in authority only in the event that the first presidency and the quorum of the 12 were somehow destroyed. And the Doctrine and Covenants verse says, uh, you know, so in verse 25, this is section 107, uh, so First, it references the 70, and then in verse 26, it says, and they form a quorum equal in authority to that of the 12 special apo- witnesses or apostles just named. And so um, so what's interesting is, yeah, that President Hinckley said, hang on, I should have opened that in a separate tab, amateur, amateur, because now it's taking forever oh, to read no. that. Anyway, but the President Hinckley said, only if, right? He said... Yeah, only in the event would become equal in authority only in the event that the first presidency and the quorum of the twelve. That's not what the what it says. What my interpretation of that is, is I think that you know the way we understand it, presiding people who preside hold keys. So the first presidency, and specifically the president of the first presidency, holds the keys. If there is no first presidency, the quorum of the twelve collectively holds the keys, and mm-hmm. if they were gone, then the seventy would hold the keys. So I think that's what he means, that they would become equal in authority in that they hold those presiding keys only in the event that the first yeah, person which makes sense. But if you read what the Doctrine and Covenant says, it doesn't matter who's alive and who's dead, how many quorums there are currently extant, the, the 70 is equal in authority to the, to the quorum of the 12. It's just that the keys would only pass to them if the first presidency and the quorum of the 12 were gone. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's funny to remember, folks, uh, every time the prophet passes away, the first presidency is dissolved. It's gone. Um, it's not like the other two counselors hang out or anything like that. There is no more first presidency for the interim. That's our little interregnum, if you will, that we have in our own church. Um, and then the mem- the counselors in the first presidency, assuming they are members of the Quorum of the Twelve, which nowadays they are pre- always are, but uh, I believe scripture They haven't always been in the past. They don't, and they, they don't have to be. Or but like, the, yeah, the last time we had one that wasn't was like during uh, President David O. McKay's was it, wasn't it when, he had the, when he had the third counselor who used to be an assistant to Oh, the he 12? was like a fifth counselor. Something like, like that. Yeah, yeah. He, had, he had more than two counselors, which was interesting. And one of them was not. Uh, and then there's people like J. Reuben Clark, who when he was called to the first presidency was not an apostle, but immediately upon being called to the first yeah. presidency, they ordained him an apostle. And so that's, and that's, that's more common that, it, you know, it, I mean, it's still not common, but it's more common that it happens that way. But yeah, for whatever reason, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but there was this one counselor in David O. McKay. And like you said, I think he had been a, a, an assistant to the 12 and they never ordained him an apostle. And I'm not sure why. It says uh, Reuben Clark was not an apostle. Um, I'm just doing some Wikipedia. Members of the per- first presidency who were not apostles. Wikipedia has all the answers. Mm. You ready for some of these you might know? Sidney Rigdon was never a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. So that's yep. an interesting bit there of stuff go. here. Jesse Gauss, Frederick G. Williams was mm. known. John Smith, Joseph Smith Sr. Um, William Law. John C. Bennett. Urgh. I was going to say, um, half the people you just named did not stay in the church very long. These are not good. Uh, John R. Winder, this is later. Charles W. Nibley, the most recent one was Thorpe B. Isaacson, who was That's from 1965, 1965 to 1970. He was his counselor with President McKay from for those five years. 
And da, 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 he was a high priest. And all that. He's so seen as, as a counselor. Of, I assume it, was, it doesn't say which council he was. Yeah. I don't, I don't like I said, I think he was, was like but. fifth, like third or fourth or fifth counselor. Like he wasn't, you know. Well, so, so, so he was called in there in 65, but then less than a year later, he was called October 1965 to, the, to be a counselor in the first presidency. And he was an assistant at the Quorum of the Twelve. Oh, yeah. And then he had like a stroke or heart attack or something, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. So, so he had a stroke in February of 66, which severely limited his activities. So then Alvin R. Dyer was also added as a counselor at the time. But it's um, just funny. I mean, you wonder why they didn't just release him and be like, go convalesce. But they oh, said we don't they- do that. We don't, we don't, we don't do that. We, we, we probably don't even <laughs> tell anybody they're sick. We just, you know. Yeah. Anyways, um, one little bit though, folks. What happens if the 70 also disappear? Just so you know, it falls on the stake presidents of the church. All where the did you get that info? Remind us where you got that info. Uh, D. Michael Quinn wrote a book or an essay about it some some years ago. I looked this up once because I was teaching a lesson four years <laughs> plus four plus years ago on the succession crisis during the time after Joseph Smith's martyrdom. And uh, it was very interesting to dig into obviously what happened back then and kind of how we got to where we are now. Um, even going as far as Brigham Young always referred to himself as an apostle. And even this notion that essentially like the first presidency would come for the most part stem from the 12, that it stems from the authority of the 12 kind of started with Brigham Young taking mm-hmm. the reins of the church. If you remember, he wasn't even church president until three years after, I think the uh, he, he was, they were already in the Salt Lake Valley. Yeah, no, he time, led the whole pioneer trek as senior apostle. As yeah. senior apostle. There was no church president. And that lasted for a while. When he passed away, John it was it was a multi-year gap before John Taylor was actually the president of the church. It, it eventually got kind of normalized. So this is just more, I could geek out about this, but we don't need to talk about it anymore. That's okay. It, it's a good, it's interesting stuff to geek out about. Uh, let's completely switch gears, Jeff. I want to just just give us a 180 spin right now. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners are wondering if we're going to talk about this. And we are Uh, just very recently in the last few days, David Archuleta uh, posted an Instagram video and it's very long. I mean, it's so funny. I I actually, when I was, when I was listening to it and I saw how long it was, I I was surprised because I thought for some reason, I thought that like, like unto Twitter and other like, you know, sort of, you know, short, form social media type things. I was like, I thought there was a limit, <laughs> but apparently you could just keep on going when you're recording an Instagram video. You just There's no talking. limit uh, as far as I could see. Yeah. It was slightly under an hour, uh, David Archuleta talking uh, in a very sincere and open sort of heart to heart between him and anyone who cared to listen. And um, it was very moving. I, I, I don't think you had time to do to listen to the whole thing, did you, Jeff? No, not really. No. Yeah, and, and you should, and I think everybody should. And it's one of those things where, like, I mean, you know, it's a work day for me, and I had other things to do in their house. But luckily, I had I had some tasks and that didn't require I, my full attention. And that's attention. why I couldn't, because today was right. a federal holiday, and so I wasn't working. Right. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, that's true. Time. It was a federal this, holiday. I'm like this is the kind of thing I would put on while I was working on doing some work. But oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, what's interesting is I I did still work today. We have like floating holidays and today is one of those optional days. And so I, I opted to use my floating holiday on a different I'm day. I'm glad to know you think civil rights are optional, Jared. Can I don't. Know? I still celebrated Dr. King, uh, but I also put in a, a work day. And But I had some tasks that didn't require my full attention. So I listened to David Archuleta while I did my work. And yeah. um, anyway, I, I highly recommend finding some time to listen to him. Uh, he was very, like I said, it's very moving. He was very open and willing to be vulnerable with us, which I always think is admirable when somebody's um, open to that. Uh, I, I'm so glad that we're, it seems to me that we're really moving past the past age of machismo and men don't cry or talk about their feelings, that sort of a thing. I think that's a good, to me, that's a good step in the right direction. And I, and I hate to like do any kind of disservice to David Archuleta or his post by trying to just abbreviate and, you know, sum it up, but because, well, you I have mean, to, he, he spoke for an hour. You I no know, choice. but basically what it got down to is he's talking about him being not heterosexual. And I'm not really sure how he defines himself because when he first announced that he came out, the article said that he identified as bisexual and asexual. There was like, you know, sort of a, a mix and in the video, it sounded much more like he was talking about being homosexual. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was another thing that, well, just as an aside, that was interesting. So he was talking about this and he was talking about how he is coming to a point where this identity and understanding, you know, being out 
and being open about who he is and who he is attracted to, who he wants to spend his time with and who he wants to be, have a companionship with. It's coming at odds now with his beliefs and his practice as a member of the church. And it's, and it's a very difficult thing for him because he believes these things and he wants to believe these things and he wants to adhere to the practices that he believes are correct and that he was taught and raised with. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, he wants to not be alone and he wants to have companionship and he wants to be in a happy marriage that he can dedicate himself to and have, you know, a real spark of romance, you know, and, and a real, you know, firm companionship and, 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 and in his experience. And I believe he's had three, three different engagements with women that have all, that he broke off. Wow. He's, it, he is not for lack of trying that he's, you know, that he, he has tried to have successful heterosexual relationships that, you know, lead towards uh, temple marriages and they don't work because he's gay or because he's not, you know, straight, he's not heterosexual. And so anyway, he's having a very difficult time and he took an hour of his time and our time on Instagram to talk about that. And it's, it's very tender and it's like, and I, and I, and it's, I, it's hard for me to imagine listening to that without sympathy. And I think it's a good way to get some good perspective on somebody who is a believing member of this church who is having a hard time reconciling his sexuality and his identity with those beliefs and teachings. It's, he doesn't, he, you know, he's talking about basically how he's having a hard time seeing where he fits in the plan of salvation and where he fits with church culture and church practice and, and um, you know, the model of the family that we believe in so much. And anyway, I just really feel for the guy. And I think everybody, it, it would be good for everybody to, to listen to that and, and have some, widened perspective on how difficult that can be if you want to believe these things, but also feel like you don't fit in. Uh, there was a significant portion of the video where he talked about suicide ideation and how, you know, he said he, he was taught at some point that uh, in the resurrection, that this burden would be taken away and that the logical course for your mind to take when you're taught that is, well, maybe it would be better for me to die so that I can be done with this burden and be ready for the eternities in which I can finally, you know, meet somebody and have a heterosexual eternal relationship with them. And I, ah, it just kills me that that, that's, that, that's, that people think of that as a potential solution. We talked about this, or I don't know if we did, but I know uh, Rich, uh, Richard Osler, who we had on the show when we talked about his book, Listen, Learn, Love. Mm -hmm. um, in his book, he talks about that, that danger of teaching, oh, that it's going to be taken away after you die, because that does lead, you know, Dave Archuleta's case is not unique that, 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 that leads to suicide ideation. And in some cases it leads cases, it leads to suicide. Um, so anyway, there's so many good things for us who, I mean, and by us, I mean, people who are heterosexual, people who are cisgendered, people who have never had to worry about thinking about those sorts of things. It's good, I think, for us to listen to that and get some sympathy and empathy and compassion for people who do not have the same experience with life and the church um, as we do. Yeah. I was surprised by some of the uh, comments on our Facebook page about this. I mean, some it surprised me because I think for the most part, this is just about everything you said, you know, right? Like we should listen to folks, but some people are just like, why... Why? Or why is he airing his dirty laundry in public? Like, why? Are you, I know. Why, it's why, like, like there is no dirty laundry in here. This is just this I'm gay and I'm having a hard time. <laughs> like, and, and he has a platform about it. I think that's the most important thing. Like, sure, you could say this is a, your private struggle about what is your private life and stuff between you and God. But at the same time, you're a notable individual who has these struggles and is trying to find your place. And hopefully, your words can resonate with others. It can resonate with people who, like you said, might be thinking the only way out is death. And maybe make them rethink that. Maybe make them think there's another way. Like that's important. If you have that kind of influence and you can use it for good, and it's clear he's not agitating against the church in any real way. He's not trying to like put the church down, but he's talking about his struggles. And I think that's, I think that's just real and authentic and good for him. You know, we should be our, our authentic selves uh, as we as we say. Um, yeah, good for him. I, I will. I will still watch it all. I want to watch it all. I want to be. I don't want to be delinquent. Yeah, no. Me. Like I said, I, I know. I think it's fine. You know, to, you don't have to like give it your full attention for an hour. But I think you know, you can find if you can find some time to put it on while you're making dinner or 
whatever you know around the house give it a good give it a listen and Inst- instagram does allow playback speed changes so it you can does i yeah i i was looking to see if i could make it one and a half speed but i couldn't you figure can go that out to two you can crank this out in half the time well i didn't want to go up to two because i, I found when i listened to like marco polos or something on double speed that i'll miss things and so i was like <laughs> if i could put it one and a half that's it's a happy medium where i save some time but i'm still giving him his due and like hearing everything he says but yeah, well, you can right. do, I, I, I guess I'm a Luddite. I couldn't figure, I couldn't figure, find the playback <laughs> speed controls on my <laughs> Instagram app. All right. Um, kind of in the same area. So Matthew Gong, we've talked about before. Matthew Gong is Elder Garrett W. Gong's son. Matthew Gong is gay. And um, he's written about on his Medium page uh, about some of his experiences with all of, all of that, being a, a gay son of an apostle. Um, he came, it's probably about two years ago. I think he got kind of a lot of press for one of the articles he wrote and he's, he decided to write kind of a recap of 2021 through a, a series of little mini essays. And one of these, uh, built on sand 2019. So I'm assuming this happened in 2019. And this is pretty interesting. He, I remember this is, this is his lens, right? This is his story. Okay. But like we don't, I'm trusting him that he's being uh, truthful with everything, but there's no other way to independently verify this. So he says, there's a trend that I've found disturbing in the church. People keep asking me to put them in contact with Elder Gong so that he can, quote, help them stay in the church. Um, and he's also seen some chatter that he's an ally. He's going to bring about change. He might be a little more progressive on some of these fronts. And he does say, despite him being highly visible, there's still a very strict hierarchy, hierarchy, even in the upper echelons of the church. Even if he wanted to affect change, he's constrained by seniority, tradition, and public perception. Interesting way to lead off and a good reminder to us folks that yes, even somewhere like the Quorum of the Twelve, there are those who can throw more weight around and those who have been there longer. And of course they have disagreements about things. I mean, that's totally understandable. And you've got to, how would you feel if you're Elder Gong, the second youngest apostle in the church, and you might have some big ideas, but are you going to get up there and tell Russell and Jeff and Dallin like what they should be doing? Like you could totally understand uh, that kind of mentality. So the short of it is he decided the fir- it was the first time he brought his partner home to meet his parents. They went out to dinner. He picked a nice place so they could have a, a pleasant meal and make his parents feel comfortable. And everything went great. It was a very nice meal. He felt very positive about the experience. And then as they were pulling up to the driveway, he says his dad, Elder Gong, spoke up because they'd taken a photo while they were there just to commemorate the occasion. And his dad just kind of out of nowhere said, please don't post that photo anywhere. And he said, Wait, what are you talking about? What photo? He's like, the photo from the dinner we wouldn't want people to get the wrong idea. And then he said he got, Matthew says he got bitter. He said, what's the wrong idea that you had dinner with your son? And Elder Gong just said, please don't post the photo. We wouldn't want people to get the wrong idea. Um, Matthew Gong was frustrated by this, understandably. is all, all he sees this as is like, what's, what's the wrong idea to be had here that you had you know, or essentially, are you saying like you're endorsing homosexual relationships because you went to dinner with your son and his partner? Um, interesting insights there. And I am curious if that is what the, the wrong idea would be. Is it that the quorum of the 12 are cool with this, more or less? Is that the wrong idea? And My impression I, is, though, that because Matthew Gong was out well before Elder Gong was uh, made an apostle. So this that's is true. A likely that's true. well before uh, he was... Uh, put in the quorum of the 12. So it's, yeah. I, it, so again, I don't know if he's thinking about it, this reflecting on him as, it, cause he was a church leader before that, you know, I, I believe he was in the 70, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. but, or, you know, if, I, I don't know, it's hard to say. And again, like you said, we're getting one perspective on this story. Um, and I don't doubt that it's true. He even posted the picture on, on, on uh, you know, underneath this blog post. So you can see that there, he, there they are at lunch at a restaurant mm-hmm. together uh, or dinner. Anyway, um, so, yeah, I don't know I, who's to say, it, it, assuming that those are the words that we wouldn't want people to get the wrong idea if he's talking about it from his perspective as a church leader, if he's speaking at, from a perspective of somebody whose peers would look well on that or whatever, but it, it's still, I, I identify with Matthew's point here. Like, I don't know. I, it, it would be hard not to feel like, Oh, my dad's ashamed of me or my dad's, yeah. you know, yeah. doesn't want to acknowledge who I am or, or be associated with me. Like, I don't know. I, I think that's really hard. Um, and I really feel for him. It's, it, but it's also a hard position for Elder Gong because I'm sure he does feel pressure to live up to a certain standard. And maybe in this case, 
I don't know. It's not for me to judge. I, I don't want to like comment too much on this, but I, yeah, I, I, but I definitely, I definitely see Matthew's point, and I think that would be extremely difficult to have an experience like that with your own parents. Agreed. And I was about to say, I, I think I get accused of being the uh, devil's advocate too much, but like you said, like Elder Gong's side of it too. Like, I mean, yeah, what, what, like we don't. What, what position is he in, and what pressures does he feel, given his role in the church and? PR and and legal things were all sorts of stuff for better or worse. And that's there are not sometimes not easy answers, uh, unfortunately, on some of these issues. The easy answer is to love everyone and listen to people and and all that. So much that has to do with our private conduct, with how we interact with other people. But when you're like a when you're a public face of the church, we I'd want to think that you could also do the same thing and just show everyone like, hey, we can love people and this is cool. But I know there are a million other other things on his mind that also are, are are of concern, which doesn't necessarily excuse any of it. But uh, like you said, we can't judge too much because there's a whole other world that our gong is a part of that we are not privy to, you know? So it's tough. What can you do? It is interesting though, because we have seen now like, you know, other Christopherson's brother, um, Tom has been, you know, very open and out and, you know, and now he's going to date. Right. And I don't don't know, like I can see, you know, Todd Christopherson, as far as I can tell, has never made an open statement about having to distance himself from his brother. He hasn't seemed to to try to distance himself from his brother. His brother uh, wrote an entire book about his experience as a gay Latter-day Saint. Uh, Like I said, he's like, he's dating again. And it's just like, I don't know. I mean, I think there are ways to be in the 12 and be of the 12 and also be supportive of your gay family members. But again, I'm not in that position. So I don't know. I don't know how, how difficult I would perceive it if I were, if, if that were me, but that's yeah. all I can say. We don't know. We don't know. Uh, so going, moving on to another story, which is tangentially related to these last two stories we've talked about. BYU released uh, a, 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 a press release that the university communications website has put up this post uh, noting that they are updating their demonstration policy. Oh boy. Yeah. Which is really funny. I love that it used to be called the public expression policy, which I'm glad they changed that name because it's like, (laughs) if you are putting out the impression that you are policing your students, ability to publicly express themselves. It's sort of like, that feels a little fascist, you know, walking around campus with a Radiohead shirt on is public expression. Like what is that? Or or a Che shirt. I I, I saw my share of Che t-shirts when I was on campus at BYU. That's public expression, right? I had a shirt Um, that said free Winona from when Winona Ryder got arrested for shoplifting. That's my Hey, she deserved everything. Just kidding. Um, (laughs) Anyway, so they've updated their demonstration policy. And there's oh, a few good. things. It's like here and there. Like there's, it used to be that you needed a a faculty sponsor. Now you you can skip that step and directly appeal to, uh, you know, you know to to create if you want to have a demonstration, you can uh, directly appeal to whoever it is in charge up in the administration that uh, approves these things. Um, they note it as part of the the statement that BYU campus is private policy, private property. This is although university property is not a public forum, the university permits responsible and safe demonstrations by current students and employees. I thought that was interesting because I would think if you were like on the faculty or, you know, on some sort of staff at BYU, that it would be kind of an iffy thing for you to join a demonstration. Uh, but it says that the policy allows employees to participate in dis- demonstrations. But they need to be, you know, consistent with BOU's faith-based mission, intellectual environment, mm-hmm. requirements described in the policy, et cetera. So, you know, all that's like, okay, that makes sense. Uh, but then when you get down into the nitty-gritty, you get down to the end of the statement. And it after it talks about these really general principles that apply to their demonstration policy, it goes into just a few last bullet points. And uh, the second to last bullet point, well, there's three. The, the second one says locations where demonstrations are prohibited, including any locations within university buildings, uh, near places uh, where minors, wait, 
and, and other, other vulnerable, vulnerable populations are present, such as the BYU preschool. There is a preschool on campus. Oh, uh, come on. You can't protest at the preschool. What, right, because, you know, what, they don't want to, like, threaten for? minors. Like, that makes sense. It says, oh, and yeah. locations where safety is a risk, including university-owned portions of White Mountain. <laughs> so, uh-huh. like, there's, like, this throwaway line in the statement. It's like, we're you got to be you got to restrict your demonstrations away from these areas including places where safety is a risk and that and where safety might be a risk is on the white mountain so obviously guys let's put two and two together let's connect the dots the rainbow colored dots mm-hmm. they're talking about there have been now two within the last two three years two years two times where people have hiked up to the y and used colored flashlights as they stand alongside the you know, the outline of the white colored Y up on Y mountain, they mm-hmm. used specifically colored uh, flashlights to make it look like the Y was lit up as a rainbow. And this was interpreted. No one ever made a statement about it. Nobody ever claimed responsibility for it, but it's interpreted as meaning as, as it was that it was a protest regarding LGBTQ plus rights on BYU campus. So this policy update, which is very specific about you know, cons- being concerned about the safety of people doing demonstrations on White Mountain is very, like to me and to a lot of people, very clearly in response to recent protests to now, where the Y has been used to make a statement about LGBTQ plus rights. Um, and that's just interesting, right? Um, and, and I also think it's interesting, you know, when we were texting about this when this news dropped, and I, I believe it was me, I shared a photo uh, of a, a screen cap from Arrested Development, and uh, you know, <laughs> I was you know, thinking of that exact thing when you and, said, uh, you know, and, the, and uh, Lindsay Bluth shows up to protest something. I think the war in Iraq, and they, they she joins she, a bunch of other she, people. She protests it because her stylist is a reservist and gets right, called and up to go right. to Iraq. Right, right. And so she's like, she, I've so got to go. Goes, to war. She joins a bunch of people who are going to go to a military base and protest the war. And at the military base, they take all the protesters and put them on a little bus, take them out to the designated freedom expression area or whatever it's called. And it's basically a little like 10 by 10 chain link cage. (laughs) And and they allow them to protest in there, away from anyone who will ever see them, et cetera, et cetera. And I was just like, I was reading through this whole thing and I was like, this feels very much like, all right, you're allowed to protest, but here's all the rules that you have to follow if you're going to make a demonstration. And I was thinking about, it's been several years, but I did read... uh, Thoreau's on civil disobedience mm-hmm. <laughs> once upon a time. And I was like, imagining having a conversation with Thoreau who, 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 who went to jail because he refused to pay some kind of tax. And he spent several days in jail until his friend like paid the tax for him. But it's, and he was kind of mad because he was like, defeats the purpose. Anyway, and then like imagining a conversation with Thoreau and I was like, here are the circumstances in which it's permissible to demonstrate. <laughs> He'd be like, What? That makes no sense. Like, you know, if you're protesting, if you're demonstrating, like, you don't follow the rule. <laughs> anyway, I just, I mean, and, I, and again, and I get why there are like safety rules and considerations and things like that. But I just think it's so funny when we try to like really specifically order like this is this is the this is the way in which you are permitted to voice your uh, opinion, your strongly held opinion about things that are happening in the world. Oh, not only that, the numbers. All right. Demonstration now means an event that occurs on university property that is not sponsored by the university in which two or more people gather to raise awareness about or express a viewpoint on an issue or cause. Now, in theory, this would mean if protest, especially if it didn't come from like a random student club or something like that, it could be considered a protest if two of you stood there and just said like, please come to our LARPing event right, on the lawn, because this is a cause we care about quite a bit. And there's two of us passing out flyers for it on paper that could now be considered a demonstration uh, of some sort. I don't think it'll get to that. Of course, the other side of that is wouldn't that mean missionaries on campus are also demonstrators, but yes, I, think they they, I, I think they might, might have they a should be out arrested for because that. Because it also notes that uh, demonstrations are limited to people who either stu- you know students or, or members of the faculty or member or employees, and so the missionaries aren't members, you know, employees or students. Uh, so if they show up and start walking across campus, I think they should be kicked off. You know, I, I was thinking about that too. I was just like, yeah, what if two people are both wearing like rainbow colored Y t shirts and they're walking together across the quad? Is that now a demonstration? because there's two people who are advocating the same thing with their t-shirts. And so, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a interesting, like you said, how, how broad it is defined. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anyway, the whole, Wyoming, the whole well, Wyoming mountain thing. It's like, uh, can we even allow hikes up the Y in general then if it's, if it's dangerous? Well, and that's the thing. So who's policing that, right? Like nobody, I, mean, it's like, I hiked to the Y a couple of times and, you know, and, and, and anyone in Provo, if you're going to hike the Y, I highly recommend you go past the Y and go up the saddle. It's beautiful up there. Like the Y, it's just the Y, but there's a, oh, there's a whole mountain up there. That's really pretty. Anyway, they when I mountains. hiked the Y, there's no gatekeeper. There's not even, I think there might be a gate, but it's not even locked. Like there's it's, like, it's a, there's a trailhead. That's all yeah, it is. It's, it's a, a trailhead. Trail trail and so yeah. I'm interesting to know how they will like enforce and police this policy. I, if I was a wagering gambling type man, Jeff, I would put down money <laughs> that within the next six months, we are going to see the Y lit up in rainbows again. And no one's going to be able to do anything about it because it's like, what, like, is everybody going to check everybody going up, hiking up? To make sure they don't have a colored flashlight on them, like you know, like I just don't understand what, how you're gonna if, like keep this from other, happening. I mean, what if it was the other way though? Say the flashlights are on, somebody's alerted to it on campus, and they rush over to the trailhead with the authorities, whatever they may be. Isn't the only way back down, back down the trail? Could they not? It's true, and I mean, you could hike catch up everybody the coming down and thing. No, and then and, get and down do, the other side and hike out to the highway. But I mean, so you're not going to do that in the middle of the night. Yeah, I mean, so no, like, I mean, and then it's an empty your pocket no. situation, basically. And then, so you know, what? So, so who has the authority to do so? Does campus police show up? Does campus police have the authority to make arrests? Like, I don't know. Like, again, if they're breaking the law, they can make an arrest if it's not an actual legal. I mean, I don't know, but then the university charge you with trespassing at that point. Like, yeah, this maybe. Is, this I mean, I just like I said, I think that if people want to light the Y in rainbow colors, they're gonna white light the Y in rainbow colors. So it turns out in the history of humanity, even when you tell people you can't protest this or that action, it doesn't really do anything to stop that action. You know, life finds a way. I mean, life there have finds been, a way. There have our been favorite fun- chaos theorists has said. yeah uh, there have been far more like there have been repressive regimes in the history of the world some of which succeed for a very long time I'm not saying BYU is a repressive regime just to be clear but uh, <laughs> but um, and yet and yet people find a way often to rise up people find a way to protest people find a way to push back and agitate and you can and this doesn't mean like you don't have rules at all. But this just seems like we're going a bit beyond the mark, just a tad, and uh, it's just gonna all. It's just bad PR for BYU, and for how much gain? Very little, I think. Really, I mean, this yeah, is- I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I think we've said our piece about this one. Yep. All right, couple. I'm gonna hit you with a couple of random uh, quickies, okay? So we'd like to do these mid-show, or well, I guess we're near the end of the show here, but here we are. So here's a story that comes out of Australia, and. The headline reads, unelectable Victorian liberals seek to dump Mormon candidate. The big the big takeaway I got from reading this article, and this comes out of The Age, an Australian newspaper, is simply that the Mormon connection is immaterial to the story itself. This is not like, like it doesn't even need to be in the headline. It, this, is, this is a classic case of the media going out of its way to use Mormon almost as a pejorative or use it as a way to put intrigue in a headline or use it to make something potentially that much more interesting. Like, Oh, the Mormons, the unpalatable one. Aha. Uh-huh. Cause yeah. it really has nothing to do with it. It's just that there's this member, Cynthia Watson, who apparently is a bit too member of parliamentary systems, by the way. Uh, they, they work differently a bit sometimes than we do here for our American listeners. Sometimes you vote by party in certain writings or areas. And then from a party list, the party will select who's a member of parliament from that list. So you might not be running in your equivalent of a congressional district with your name. You win the election if you're the one who gets the most votes. It can be different than that. And there's a lot of politicking within the party to be atop the list. So if your party wins in that precinct, whatever you want to call it, um, then you can you can get there and they can do it. So they're not too big on Cynthia Watson because of her religious right views that might make her unelectable. And well, that's not really even, the, I mean, religious right, yes, but also just far right anyway. Like people that she associates with have been like arrested for like, you know, not not, not even violent, but like for like, uh, you know, harassing uh, homosexual people at, you know, and at, at a church and for harassing Muslim, you know, people and immigrants and things like that. And so it's like, you know, it's not even, I mean, maybe it's associated with some sort of religious belief uh, with whatever sect, but she's associated with these people who are very far right leaning to, you know, to the point of like, you know, 
being extremely intolerant of others. Yeah. And so that's not good. That's the, that's like what we have there. And by the way, if you read the article, it talks about liberals. Um, just bear in mind, liberal means different things in different countries. The liberals in uh, Australia are actually the center-right political party. They are basically the Republicans of Australia. Labor is the uh, leftist party there. Just so you know, folks. You see liberals, you might be confused about some of the language if you read the article. I know I was. Uh, I'm going to throw another quick one at you. The man we know is Captain Moroni. <laughs> That that delightfully ofi fella who marched on the on the Capitol back on January sixth, twenty twenty one, a day that will live in infamy, um, and for, I also credited the Deseret News for actually labeling it the an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Thank you, Deseret News, for calling it what it is. What it um, is yeah. Anyway, so this man Nathan Wayne and Trekken, the Arizona man, who dressed up like Captain Moroni. We saw a lot of videos of him breathlessly like you know how it was like the classic member of the church who was given a, a window to explain something about our theology and then you're trying to rush in as much as you can he's like and captain Rona, and he believed in freedom and so he took the title of liberty and he wrote the freedom he marched on the people and he marched around and he marched and he marched to the lamanites who the lamanites didn't believe in freedom the lamanites didn't believe in these things and he was just kind of you know rambling on excitedly to try to wedge in as much possible explanation about our sacred text as he could in, uh, on video which you know bless his heart for doing that but don't bless his heart for uh, you know doing what he did at the Capitol and trying to weaponize Captain Moroni to make his point. So he's entered a plea deal, um, or he's working on one, uh, on five federal misdemeanors. Obviously, he was not one of the ones who was like breaking in all the way into the halls of the Capitol and this and that. Although the, although the article did note that he is suspected of looting, but the looting doesn't show up on the list of charges. So I think yeah. they're, they're kind of letting that one go. It seems to be that way. So basically, they're, he's going to get a plea deal on... Um, his misdemeanor accounts, which where was the actual accounts? I'm trying to remember what the tra- actual specific charges were for him as far as what the misdemeanors were. Uh, I think it was uh, light treason. Oh, wait, no, that, that's another <laughs> arrested another development. development. Uh, arrested. Yes. I may have committed some uh, light. Okay, I've got it. it entering <laughs> and remaining in a restricted building or grounds, disorderly and disruptive conduct in, res- in a restricted building or grounds, Entering and remaining in certain rooms in the Capitol building. I love that that's a charge. Certain rooms in the Capitol building is a formal charge. Uh, Disorderly conduct in a Capitol building and parading, demonstrating, or picketing in a Capitol building. So much like BYU, the Capitol is very sensitive about who is allowed to demonstrate where within the, the Capitol grounds. And this man did not obey those rules. And it turns out that that's against the law. Yeah. And what's curious is... If convicted, normally you could spend up to more than a year in prison for some of these crimes, even if they're misdemeanors. But that's right. the article probably notes that he probably won't. It's probably just probation. That's my right. guess. Maybe a little fine. All righty. Well, you know, what's um, interesting about this article, by the way, and is just that they know they were noting how many people were involved. It says the federal prosecutors have filed criminal cases against seven hundred thirty-three people. I, I know, honestly. I didn't realize. I, I thought it was smaller than that for some reason. And uh, if and if you know if they filed charges against seven hundred thirty-three, there were more than that. And I don't know why I thought it was like a few hundred, but it was like it's huge, over seven hundred. Like I, 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 I will admit I have been in some ways purposely ignorant about this. Like mm-hmm. some news just gets depressing, and so I haven't always. So I choose what I delve into with the news. <laughs> And I guess I haven't delved into that one as much. So I honestly was was unaware. I was ignorant of the sheer number of people involved in this. And uh, holy cow. Hey, I, I see you, you You grabbed another story that you were going to. But before we do that, let's just put on one yeah. little just weird, weird interest story. Hit me. Uh, Hit me. There was a, a guy in Idaho who uh, who's went missing back in like the, the 19 teens. He was a notorious bootlegger uh, who was also a murderer. And he had been known to, you know, bootleg or rob or whatever, and then, you know, escape from prison because he would hide like a, a file or, an, or a, a saw in his boot so that he could escape. I don't know why the, the authorities didn't start searching his boots. This man, uh, his name was Joseph Henry Loveless. And his body was recently identified in Clark County, Idaho, not too far from where I live. Uh Anyway, this dismembered headless body had been discovered in a cave over the 
course of the last year. And I, and I, and I mean, in the, over the course, because his body was not all found at once. They found his torso. It's like and a fossil. His... Like you got to reassemble the components. Right. But, but this, but sure. his bodily pieces were very purposely spread throughout this cave system. And they've slowly found the pieces of his body, except for his head and put it back together. DNA, they, they, they took a sample. They found that one of the part of his leg was remarkably well preserved and they were able to get a really good DNA sample out of it. And they started uh, searching through DNA databases and they found his grandson who was 86 years old and they were able to make a connection and figure out who this guy was. Uh, and so he was this, they, fa- they figured out he was this notorious bootlegger. Uh, the last thing that he had done was he had murdered his wife with an ax and dismembered her. And he was arrested for that murder, but shortly after escaped prison and they never knew what happened to him. And now that now we know uh, over a hundred years later, and I love it because the, the article speculates like they're pretty sure the reason why they found him dismembered in a cave is probably because the member, the, the family members of his departed wife that he killed were probably just fed up with him continuing to get off uh, from the crimes that he committed because of his continual escapes from prison. And they probably took justice into their own hands, took him apart and left him Ooh. in a cave. Uh, anyway, just funny little interest, like human interest story. Oh yeah, uh, because he was he was LDS at one point in his life, um, but uh, no more. And anyway, now we know that. So that's, was Alice Cooper, right? Anyway, as they say, uh-huh. who was that? Paul Harvey. That was the rest of the story. Yeah. <laughs> now we know. You can read that at Smithsonian Mag. It's an interesting uh, rundown. That's a classic case of Mormons behaving badly. The segment the sisters like to do. This is very bad. Very, yes. very badly. Yes. And I swear that segment always revolves around people in Idaho. I don't know if it's because they live in Idaho, but it's always stuff in Idaho. No, it's because it's the, the, the worst. They send the worst of us here. I guess so. A <laughs> uh, couple of things that we're going to lead. So uh, they've announced the dedication date for the Yigo Guam Temple. This temple's kind of flown up since they started building it. They didn't, didn't even announce it uh, very long ago. They broke ground in 2019. Uh, it was announced in October 2018. So I guess in that in theory, it's actually tracking about the typical three-year process. I didn't realize it had already been uh, that long, but they will dedicate it. Elder David A. Bednar will dedicate it on May 22nd, 2022. There will be an open house from May 4th until May 14th uh, to come check it out. Very small temple, but it serves the comparatively small population of Guam and the number of members there. Uh, this, but this is this is another example of a small temple serving a small number of saints, but good for them. And that's great. So... There's a couple that are kind of following this template, um, like uh, I think the Puerto Rico temple and the one in Cape Verde. They're kind of like following this sort of style. So those will be starting to come online soon. So good for them. And now I want to pivot into the world of COVID, if you'll permit me, Jared. Um, real quick, a note went out. There was supposed to be one of those face-to-face events. Uh, on uh, January 29th, the youth face-to-face event. Focusing on the 2022 youth theme, big rollout of it. The youth theme is trust in the Lord for this year. They have postponed it until Wednesday, March 9th, uh, Mountain Standard Time, because, quote, due to the exposure of multiple face-to-face participants to COVID-19 and out of an abundance of caution. So after kind of getting back to normal, I want to say, is this the first church sponsored event we've had to push back or reschedule in some time it seems um, like it you know generally things have been you know moving in phases right to being more and more open yeah with you know exceptions here and there you know that you know local authorities are still encouraged to you know monitor local you know what's going on locally and if you need to truncate your you know we we had our stake president uh just this last sunday cancel all second hour meetings and all meetings that weren't sacrament meeting uh because so you're not the COVID yeah, and, that, and that, are bad here, and that's where you are, and you've all, you've kind of been concerned that they don't take it as seriously there. And right, I, saw no, some, no, I was very happy to see the state yeah. president say, "Hey, look, it's getting bad here. Let's let's you know let's t- um, let's take some measures." And so, with the exception of some local thing, local decisions like that, I think that the church as a whole, as you noted, has just been moving forward. And so, yeah, I think this is the first time since things had started to reopen that we've seen a church level event get postponed and pushed back because of yeah. COVID numbers. So. And I kind of saw the same stuff. So we we still had our second hour, but I heard about people stopping to do this with, with the explanation of like, look, if we're distance and sacrament meeting, but it's just your family being your family, you're kind of in your pod, 
Right. But then when we break off to gospel doctrine, all of a sudden we're all crossing and mingling and we should right. just avoid that. But we did have our first, uh, we did Zoom Ward Council and Bishopric Meeting again for the first time oh, since, like, since like June of last yeah. year. Uh, so, I mean, I don't mean I don't good know. in that, that, that that's a good thing to do, that you had to do that. I mean, it's good that like your leaders recognize like, oh yeah, maybe it's, sometimes it's safer not to gather the Ward Council and cram everybody next, shoulder to shoulder in the bishop's office. Well, and but, we debated this. We're, we're, we're the first we're the first uh, ward in the building. So we were like, well, we could still meet in person. We could meet in like the Relief Society room, you know, the classic OVA buildings with the corner Relief Society room, the big, which is plenty of space. Like we mm-hmm. could do that. And understanding that we were still going to be at the building later on and have gospel doctrine in that same room. Uh, but in the end, we just elected like, no, why? We don't need to do additional risky exposure if we don't need to right now. So I don't know. It's just weird for me right now. I feel like a lot of stuff's hitting the fan again, like it wasn't before. And even outside of church, like part of this com- compounded a bit because we had our pr- a pretty brutal snowstorm here two weeks ago, which I know to our listeners in the Intermountain West, whoop de doo, right? But we had a a decent snowstorm, um, and they closed I ninety five for like two days. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that with. they closed it. Is that it, it got jammed up? Like it was an know, absolute like mess. Now Senator now, Tim Kaine was stuck in his car for twenty four hours. Yeah, and you yeah. could say. We've heard a lot about supply chains and stuff in the past year, but this d- affected local delivery of a lot of things for a while. And then coupled yeah. with with panic buying from Omicron, if you go to the stores right now, it is like it's worse than like March 2020 uh, yeah. going around just trying I to ho- find. I hope you had toilet supplies. paper already, Jeff. We had that. That stuff's not as bad. Costco's done a pretty good job staying supplied, but going to regular grocery stores just trying to find like just chicken. No, mm. totally picked off. No chicken, no bread, no eggs. Um, I think it'll ease up just as we recover from the storm and kind of get back there. But it's like, I'm having, I don't know if I call this triggering or anything, but I'm having kind of like, I told my wife, I told my wife, I'm like, I don't care about running errands normally, but I feel like I'm like, I'm like a little more on edge than I have been in a long time because this feels more apocalyptic than it has for a while. And it's a little goofy. And I'm wondering how church is going to be too. I don't know with the way numbers have been going. I wonder if we're going to have to start. I don't know. I mean, this Sunday we're supposed to be having state conference, and I'm curious. After you know, last week when the state presidency thought things were bad enough that they didn't want people crowding in together for a second hour, um, like what will the rationale be for not canceling or or state conference, or or at least at the very least, you know, putting it online and making it a YouTube state conference, like or a Zoom state conference, like yeah. I don't know. I, it is hard. It's hard in this area, like you said. I have generally had more complaints about it because even even as you know the ward and the different wards in the stake implemented the stake president's uh, council and his direction to do you know to do this i saw people commenting on like the facebook announcements and saying like why what's why would they do that and like and i don't know if they were feigning ignorance i'm assuming they were to make a point but like people continue to pretend like ah, it's not a big deal COVID doesn't really exist in eastern idaho in small town eastern idaho and it's like I just, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to, um, you know, to do what I believe is right. And, you know, and, and to like, say like, well, I, I was exposed to somebody who was diagnosed with COVID later that day. So I'm quarantining for seven to, you know, for five to 10 days or whatever it is. And people are like, why, why are you doing that? And it's like, well, because I'm trying to be a responsible citizen and neighbor and friend. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm trying to, love my neighbor as I love myself. Like, I don't know. I don't know how to explain this, you know, to well, people I, who I, don't care to understand it. I did laugh at an email that came in this week um, at, at a ward level. And it was just talking about some, we've had more ward members contract COVID uh, over the past couple of weeks than like all of COVID combined up to this point. Yeah. I, I'm um, currently aware of at least six families in my ward that have it. So yeah, and we've been very fortunate, I think, throughout COVID. It's a lot of it kind of passed over our ward, <laughs> kind of laughing like I don't know if people are you know painting with lamb's blood on their doorways or something or what's going on <laughs> here. But it's it's uh, or when does it come to that, people? When do we start doing that? Um, but I love the headline in the email. Just said reappearance of COVID, and I was like, reappearance? Where did where when was it gone? <laughs> like it's it's no. It, it's, and like that meant that's like that mentality where I'm just like, it's, it's not like we were out of the woods here, people. Yeah. Uh, that's fun. But, um, yeah, it's been pretty, I don't know. I feel a little on edge about the whole thing right now. It's, it's a little stressful. Like my, my son was in a vehicle with a kid who, um, tested positive the next day he was carpooling. And so we've been like, for the first time really since COVID started, we've been like, oh geez, like, okay, 
monitoring the kid. We're going to be doing tests. We are all going to get COVID probably. And it's because Omicron is no respecter of any preventive measures. I've decided it just does not care. It's the honey badger of COVID variants. It just <laughs> does what it wants. Omicron don't care. <laughs> Omicron don't care. Omicron don't, care. don't give up. Bleep. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Wild times. So things are happening, and you, and I think yeah. you mentioned what Temple Department has made. Yeah, some so well, here, right? that was another thing. This is a, there was actual like release again. This is church news, and the Temple Department is reminding patrons that they need to wear masks, and, and not just that they need to wear masks, but that j- there are many measures in place. That it's the, the way we attend the temple with signing up and you know for a slot, uh, the way we you know prepare ourselves and wear protective measure, you know ge- uh, our protective gear and etc. Uh, the temple, the temple department is just reminding patrons that we need to follow those things to keep each other safe. And uh, it, would, it was interesting that the this um, article, I believe it, you know, the, at the bottom of it said that it was updated uh, the fourteenth, which is three days ago as of our recording. But even more recently than that, uh, on the fifteenth, uh, our temple presidency here in Idaho. The, well, I'm in the mm-hmm. so, you know, we now have a Pocatello temple. I'm in the Idaho Falls. Uh, district right, still right. So the Idaho Falls Temple Presidency released a letter that was distributed uh, by the stakes that said uh, one of the things they noted is this week we received instruction from the Temple Department to reduce the number of patrons in each proxy endowment session to thirty oh, wow. percent of room capacity. And that's interesting. I just realized we had talked about this before we started recording, and it it, <clears throat> it didn't occur to me until just now that. The we received instruction. I don't know if that is we as in all temples or we as in the Idaho Falls Temple Presidency. They might be responding to local numbers. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's why this wasn't included in the article. So just had that epiphany. Anyway, but in light, it says in light of this adjustment, the number of proxy endowment patrons allowed in each session will now be 25. And that, so that's specific, obviously, to my temple that only 25 people can be in a endowment session. But I do think even if it's not the entire church, every temple presidency being instructed to do 30% of capacity, we still are learning that the temple department is monitoring these things and they are mm-hmm. issuing specific numbers of like how many people they want to allow and whether that's as a whole or whether that's temple by temple. Uh, it seems like they're pretty on top of it, which you know I hadn't really considered that before. And that, But that is interesting. And I wonder how that will affect uh, people's ability to schedule because you know, 25 people per endowment session, but you know, 30% capacity, it's not a lot. Um, so yeah. Well, it's like, remember when temples first opened in phase four, the crunch <coughs> for people who wanted to get married. And it was like, I mean, there were, there were no slots, right? Yep. Cause, it, Cause you could have one couple in the temple at a time doing it. And yeah, it was just the demand far outstripped the supply at that point. Do we want to knock out these last couple of things real quick? I mean, if you want to, I'm I feel perfectly well, satiated. But whatever you want to do, Jerry, let's just mention it. So first of all, there was an interesting article in religion uh, religion news, which is the website we most often reference it because of that's where Jana Reese publishes uh, a lot of most of oh, her stuff. She of little faith. Yes. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Leave her alone. <laughs> Leave Jana alone. Um, so this article was not written by Jana Reese, uh, but the it was about indigenous. I'll just tell you what the headline says. One moment, please. Indigenous Mormons struggle to balance pride and faith with LDS history. And it was interesting because it does give multiple perspectives, but the gist of the article was that people who we would glibly refer to as Lamanites, whether they are Ugh. yeah, Native Americans, First Nations, American Indians, however you locally refer to your indigenous populations in North or South America, uh, we often you know, people often just freely associate them with, you know, being descendants of the Lamanites. And this article is written from the perspective of somebody who was used to be a member of the church, but is no longer and how they have an issue with that. But then there's also, it's so, but it, 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 but I liked the article because it also, it made it, it acknowledged nuance that there are people who are in the church and still faithful who maybe are okay with being referred to as Lamanites, but still it, it, it presents problems when you're trying to reconcile your confirmable recorded history or your oral history or whatever of your tribe and then also the historicity of the Book of Mormon, or you know how much of you know how much of this, how much of our descendancy comes from Lamanites, and how much not, and things like that. It, anyway, the point of the article was it's kind of a mess, and to try and make it extremely simple and just be like, hey, these people are descendants of the Lamanites, it really um, 
it, it, it oversimplifies things and it also uh, kind of erases, it can be an erasure of, of culture. And so I think it's, it's an article well worth reading and just considering again, to be careful how we use terms and how to be, and to be careful about what kind of assumptions we make, uh, especially when we're talking about actually real people here, like real individuals who have real history, real families, real identities. Um, and it's hard to just kind of like write them off as like, you're part of this checkbox category. So anyway, yeah. good, good, good article. Worth your time. Well written by Diana Cruzman. Good job. Good work. Uh, I will touch on, I think what could be the last one. So you remember a few mm-hmm. weeks ago, um, we talked about James C. Jones. So James C. Jones was tapped by Deseret Book to develop sort of a master class type course in their Seek series. This was specifically about how Latter-day Saints can combat racism within our ranks. This is a great note to end on, really, given we let off with MLK, right? Um, now, if we talked about his Medium post, and then it turned out the church kind of backed off They they because he, he posted something pretty, you could call it scathing, very direct about Elder Holland's remarks back late last summer um, about the LGBT community and musket BYU, fire, and the musket yeah. fire, and all that, all that stuff that went down. Wherever you are on that, and I, I, I mean, I think his points were taken, and like we said, basically, I get it. Desert Book says this is too, you're too hot now for us to do business with, more or less. Lots of businesses would do that with any number of individuals. This is not like an isolated case necessarily. And, and I think even in the correspondence he published, by the way, about that experience, Deseret Book, they even said like, you are not the first nor the last person that we have associated with. And we've had to like cut ties or put the brakes on something because of some other incident that's happened or something that's come to light. Whatever it may be, Deseret Book is a brand and they care about what their association is. He viewed this as unfortunate because he's like, okay, but now like the members who need this the most, who need like an unfiltered instruction on how to work through bigotry and racism and get rid of that in our ranks because it does exist within our ranks. Just go to freaking Davis County. It is a thing, people. Holy cow, Um, it is. Yeah. But now they won't have that chance. The upside in all of this, though, is that while Deseret News said, because he said like, well, I don't know what to do. Like if you guys, I guess, own everything. They said, we own what we filmed with you. That is ours but we do not own the content you use to create it. So you can do whatever you want with it. So he has now made his own essential equivalent of that. Um, to com- And also I love the screenshot of him because he's wearing the uh, black Mighty Morphin Power Ranger uh, t-shirt, which is just- I didn't notice <laughs> I that. I believe that's what that is, Fantastic. which is great. So now he's done it himself and you can take the course. He's refilmed the course himself. He's invested his, his own uh, resources to do so. Uh, it's not cheap per se. I think it's about a hundred dollars for the entire thing or just per module. I forget what. No, it's 97. It's a six module course and the entire thing costs $97. Which isn't bad. I mean, if you do them, that's, you know, it's less than that's 15 odd dollars per, that's not terrible. Right. So, Hmm. um, anyway, so the trip profiled him, Pecky Fletcher stack interviewed him a bit, talked about his experience, uh, with what he had, with everything we discussed and then how now you can go and you can you can actually take part in his little module and i hope members will see it i don't know what it would have cost to use the seek platform for deseret book i've never used it i have no Mm -hmm. idea how it compares in terms of cost to access this and i'm assuming the production values won't quite be what they would have been with deseret book even just based on the screenshots but the contents what matters here much more than right the soft lighting the the main thing though that i kind of feel like is unfortunate and i guess maybe this would have applied to if it had been whether it had been released on deseret books platform or or his own but like the the people and and i and i lump myself i i you know i I recognize that i need anti-racist education as much as anybody but the people who really would benefit from this course are also the people who are going to be the least willing to spend 97 dollars to access this course so yeah if there had been a, a different means of distributing it, that it, you know, if they'd used it for their corporate training, and if it had been disseminated potentially to stakes and wards for use and things like that, because you know, does our book is uh, owned by the church, that could have been something. But now, now that it's going to cost ninety seven dollars, I'm afraid it won't reach as many people as it as it would have. Which I, I don't think know. Is, yeah. Seek is a curious thing because, like, what I've seen here, the only thing that's on, if you go to seek.desertbook.com, at least right now, mm-hmm. it just has three uh, Elder Bednar books. Hmm. And then you view video resources about those. And if you click learn more, 
it just takes you to a copy of the book. And if you click on video resources, it just takes you to like a YouTube playlist. Sounds so like this, they're still getting seek off the ground. Yeah, because this is like iffily shot. So, so obviously seek is something else, but I just I was trying to see if there was a cost associated with it, you know, how that would right, right. play out, but I don't see anything so far. So yeah, the downside is those who would be Desert Book patrons and say, oh, cool, the church is vouching for this. I feel com- more comfortable with it because of that. Now we'll have that opportunity and this could still be seen as some kind of fringe. I'd like to take it, you know, I, right now it's, you know, the budget is a little tight, but I think once, once I can free up 97 bucks, I'll, I'll, Kelsey and I will sit down and and take this together. Yeah. Well, Jared, like I said, when we started, when I said, let's keep the show to under an hour, but I'll talk to you in a hundred in an hour and 20 minutes. And now it's one hour, 19 minutes and 26 seconds. As I say these words, you are good. You are good, sir. Here we are. I think maybe maybe subconsciously, this is what I was actually working towards. I don't know. But either way, uh, it's been very nice to join all of you this week. Once again, please join us on social media and uh, subscribe to the show if you haven't done so. I'd like to plug Spotify once more. If you listen on Spotify, leave us a review there. They just enabled that feature. Is it and review? Please, or I thought you could just rate it like a star rating. I don't know if they whatever, allow you to write I can, reviews. I don't yeah. care. Give us five stars. Give us all the stars. All the stars. All the stars. <laughs> Give us all the stars, but write a review on uh, Apple Podcast if you're so inclined. That'd be great. And a big shout out to our supporters on Patreon. Thank you for your financial support of this show. You can go to patreon.com slash This Week in Mormons and join the cool gang. Feel the pressure. Be a real twim supporter, folks, and uh, let's make it rain. Anyway, that's all I've got. Jared, thanks so much for being here, buddy. It's good to see you. Jeff, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Always a pleasure. Happy January, everyone. Um, You know. Do well, all that good stuff. Don't freeze, yada, yada, yada. This has been This Week in Mormons. That was Jared. I'm Jeff. Talk to you again next week. More news. See you later. Oh, bye.